All right, so the first thing is that Shlema Melech says in Mishlei, Mishlei Shlema Ben David Melech Yisrael. He introduces himself, says the Vilna Gaon, before you hear from somebody, you have to know who he is. So Mishlei Shlema, we know Shlema was the smartest person in the world. Ben David tells you who he comes from, Melech Yisrael, what his job description was. That's what the Vilna Gaon says. Now you can go ahead and learn Mishlei. So before you hear somebody preaching, you have to know where he comes from. So a little bit on my personal experience of how I got here. In 2002, I saw some kids who were looking for booze and cigarettes. I didn't know anything about the sugya. It opened my eyes. I invited them to my house. I got friendly with them. They were cute kids, 14-year-olds, and they were still in yeshivas, mainstream yeshivas, but they were obviously beginning their struggle, sukkah's time. By the end of the year, they were completely off the derech, all four of them. Every Friday night, as I was about to go to sleep, I would hear a knock on the door, and they were passing by, and I watched them deteriorate. The yarmulkes changed colors, and then were off their heads, and then they were chil Shabbos. And I just watched this devastation that I knew nothing about, I didn't understand at all. But it put a, a thought into my head. All these kids at that point, 20 years ago, 2002, all these kids that are dropping out, and they're smoking up, and they're rebels, and they're on the street, they, they can't be raw, they can't be bad, they're just, they're not fitting into society. So what would happen if I took them out of the world, and I built a home for them, and I built it tailor-made to their needs? This was my idea. I had no training, no training, and no experience, I wasn't a mentor, I had nothing. I went around at that point to speak to the people who were already in the field, there weren't that many people in those days, but basically all those people laughed in my face. They said, like, you're not a therapist, you're not a psychologist, you're not a mentor, you never, you know, you came up with an idea, kids are going to come into your house and uh, into the house that you build and they're going to quit smoking weed, you think that's the way it works, and they're going to stop being bad. These old kid, kids with criminal records and they stole and they have addictions. You know what the word addiction means? And they basically all laughed and the truth is they were right. They were right. It's not a smart thing to do. But I did it anyway. At Seattle de Shmaya, I opened a place called Home Sweet Home. I moved in kids, three kids. We had up to five, six beds. Three kids moved in, and then five, six, two, four. And I picked kids who were very, very difficult. Um, I, in I interviewed them. And basically, in the home, I was the entire staff. Most places, rehabs or these kind of transitional living places that have even five kids usually have eight to 12 staff members. And you have the intake person, and then you have the therapist, and then you have the person in charge of this. And basically, it was all me. And I developed a system, which was very interesting. The kids wrote the rules, which was an interesting idea. I gave them a blank piece of paper, and I said, okay, let's write the rules. I said, we want to be successful, right? Yes, you want to leave here. They would save up the money that they made. They left between, with between ten dollars and $20,000 in savings. I said, you get on the home sweet home bus, and a year from now, I want you to get off this bus happy with money. And these are all kids that couldn't keep a job for more than a week or two, because either they messed up or their roommates kept them up at night, and they just couldn't. So I said, okay, in order to do this, you, have to, you don't want your friends to keep you up, right? So you, I, I developed the rules through them for protecting themselves from other kids, because you don't know who the other kids are going to be. For example, I said... Do you have any weapons? So most of them had switchblades or whatever. I said, okay, so let's say you're going to have a fight and you have a switchblade and the other guy has a samurai, uh, you know, and the other guy has a BB gun and the other guy has a real gun. So it's going to turn into the Wild West over here, right? So how about for your stay here, would you mind, we make a rule, no weapons. Put your weapons by your friend or by sibling or something. In this house, keep it peaceful. The guy's like, yeah, good idea, because I don't know, the other guy might have an Uzi, right? So no weapons. And like, that's how we developed all the rules. You don't want someone keeping you up at night if you want to go to sleep because you have to wake up for work. So how about after a certain time, everybody has to be in bed. We called it TIB, Tuchus in bed, right? So if you have to get up and be at work 9 o'clock, so you have to get up at 8 or 7.30, when do you need to go to bed to be rested? And if a guy said 5 o'clock... <laughs> I said, you know, it's not really reasonable. That guy was not for me. But they would say 11, 12, even though they couldn't do it, but they knew, yeah, you need a good night's sleep. I said, okay, let's make it, we can't make it too early. 
12 o'clock, TIB. Took us in bed. The lights go off, and you can do in your bed whatever you want. Just don't disturb somebody else. And that became the rule, and that was what it was. Of course, the rules are meant to be broken, and they all broke as many rules as possible. It didn't shock me, because in order to get into the house, you had to be someone who breaks rules. Otherwise, you would be in yeshiva. These were kids 15 to 22, and they broke every rule, and that was part of accidentally what I realized afterwards was the tikkun of their trauma to heal their inner brokenness was when they broke rules the way that I happened to have dealt with it, which is what I'm going to teach you parents. The way that I, I, I dealt with them when they messed up is what healed them. It was a big part of their healing. Huge part. Uh, true story. All my stories are true. My bachar of home sweet home, my first boy, he moved in and the rule was no violence. You can't punch. Now, of course, verbal abuse is terrible, and a guy can rate son, and you know. But you can't judge that. I could only judge no violence. Within a few days or a week, boy number one punched boy number two in the face. So I came to the house, I came to home sweet home, and I said, "You know the rules. You know you can't stay here because you punched him in the face." What was his reaction? I don't need this place. You think I need this place? And he cursing me, F you, F this place, F that. This kid was homeless for oh, almost four years, living on the street. He lived on a D train. He lived in, a, in an empty truck he found in Walmart. But they never say, oh, please, I'm so sorry. I really need this place, right? That's not what happens. They're so broken. They say, I don't need you. I don't need this place. And he's, he's getting his knapsack. And I said, hey, 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 hold on one second. I said, you can't stay here, but you're not out of my life. Come to my house. He said, what? I moved him into my house, into the guest suite. You stay here. Keep your job. And you come with me in the morning. At night, you'll spend time with me. That was his punishment. I said, you're out of the house, but you're not out of my life. Right? I just met this boy. Uh, it's almost 20, 20 years later. And we were reminiscing about the story. And as soon as I, I said, you remember what happened with the thing? And he started crying. Mamish tears. Mamish tears were crying. He said, nobody ever treated me that way. Nobody ever said, you know, you can't stay in the classroom because you just did whatever, but not out of my heart. Right? That was, he's today, he's, he's, he's Gavaldic. So I developed a program where I could talk about it for hours. We're not going to do that now, but I just want to tell you where I'm coming from. I opened a home, which made no sense, and um, the only thing that I had was that I, I, I believed in them. I knew that they're good, even though they're ganavim, they were stealing, they were violent, they, 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 they were bad kids. It looked like they were bad. I just knew that they were good. And I moved them in, and they, they were, uh, this is them on a good day when they moved in, boy one, two, and three. Um, this is already after the ponytail was cut off from boy number two. We had an upsharon in my house, and this is already when they were calmed down. Rabbi Yosef Rosenblum, big tzaddik, came to the house, and when we got back in the car, he turned to me and he said, they'll all be fine. And I looked at him, and I'm like, they'll all be fine? I mean, how, like, how do you know that? Like, I didn't say that, but I was like, what a bracha. Anyway, they all shine with and um, they were all, they're all fine. They all were fine. But I didn't know how to get from, from rebel to fine because they were constantly testing me, constantly breaking rules. Kids kept on moving in, and um, all of them, the, the test to get in was Chil Shabbos. You know, if I heard them on Shabbos, not on Mesech to Shabbos, on the day, and if they turned the light on and off, oh, you're in. I'm kidding, I didn't do that. But that was, you know, it was only kids who were Mechal Shabbos. We once went to the Homoac Hotel, we took a couple of rooms, and, um, you know, disaster. They were smoking in the room on Shabbos. And apparently the other guests in the hotel weren't too happy about that. And um, the house was five minutes away from my own home, and I raised my kids. Basically, Shabbos, they were at my house, Yantif, they were at my house, and then when they got a little bit more housebroken, and they could behave a little bit, I had other guests, uh, other hosts, Shabbos hosts, that would host them which was really beautiful, so they got to know the community. And the main thrust of it was, after they came home at night from work, we had uh, wonderful Jewish women in the community drop off suppers every night for them, so they ate like kings. 
I wanted them to have home cooked meals, and they felt cared for. And then from 8.30 till about 11, 11.30, every night I had volunteers take them out to have fun. That was my chap. You need to have fun in your life. So there was a, a group, and I made a group leader. I just thought of this concept. So Monday night, let's say, the group leader was Yitzi, Yitzi Kohn, Tzadik. And he had five, six guys with him. Usually four showed up. So four guys who were in their 30s left their wives and kids to come to Home Sweet Home, take out uh, three, four, or five guys. So they had, like, together a minion with three, four cars to go out to Manhattan and to go out to Dave's and Buster's and, and wherever they went to have fun. Tuesday was usually shoot pool or go bowling and went to the gym. We had a black belt give them lessons. And throughout the week, they met like 15, 20 different volunteers that they got to know. And then the Shabbos host, and then the volunteers would invite them for Shabbos. And they formed relationships. By the first graduation of three boys, one year later, where they went from off the derech, rebellious, with histories of tremendous rebellion, that nobody can contain them to the point that they were homeless. A year later, boys standing with hats and jackets, and over 450 people in the community came because they saw them in shul, and they saw, once they started going to shul, and the families knew them, and the family's kids grew up, and my kids from three years old till 20, all the years, grew up with, with understanding that this is a part of Yiddishkeit. Like Chabad families that go around the world and they, they understand there are Jews who drive on Shabbos, my kids saw that there are Jews who go off the derech and they have tattoos and earrings and piercings. I have a bag of, of a lot of necklaces that were given to me when they, when they decided to take it off. And they came in and Baruch Hashem, over time, Shuvu Banim Shevavim, this is boy number one, he actually was asked to speak at the Agudah Convention. And one after another, they left the program Shemit HaRamitzis about 95%. The first 10 was a home run. Um, kids who were, it was one of the kids who shmad before he came into us. Kids full of tattoos and kids getting married with, that's Remichel, you're here from Remichel, yeah? Right? Kids, uh, nobody expected this. And it was, it was very super duper fast, which does not happen with parents. We'll explain why a different time. Parents could take years. But this was all six months to a year. None of them went back to drugs. None of them committed suicide. None of them are anti-Jewish. 95% of them are Shemitah Mitzvahs, even hats and shaitels, and I would have been happy with Shomer Shabbat, you know? And none of them are against us. None of them are in these organizations that want to kill Yiddishkeit. Even the ones who are not from are not against us. So the question really from both sides of the aisle was, the professional world wanted to know, how did you do it? No AA, no GA, NA, SA, no meetings, right? No therapists, no therapy, no doctors, no lawyers, no nurses, nothing. What happened? How did kids who were doing drugs for years, so it was a kid doing cocaine for years who moved in September 9th, 2004. Now, he moved out from, he got married. I have relatives working for him. How come, how come they all quit the day that they moved in? And even throughout the year, the ones who fell once in a while, but they never went back to drugs. And how did you get them from falling to get clean again? And why didn't they spiral down? We have no kids who are in the jail system. All the stories you hear about kids at risk, none of these kids are a part of it. The movies that are made by these organizations that are out to make us look bad, they're not a part of it. These kids were plucked away from the whole story of all this, all every magazine article about the kid comes in and ruins the wedding, and it, not our kids. So how did you do that? That's what the professional world wanted to know, or should want to know. None of our kids went to boot camp, none of our kids went to psych wards, none of our kids went, I mean, yes, there were two or three kids that ended up going to psych wards that needed it. But they're not against us, and they're dealing with their psychiatric problems. And it's very interesting why those specific kids ended up not becoming from and needing psychiatric help, which we'll get to. It was a major eye-opener. The cure of world wants to know, okay, what, what's your trick? What'd you do? 
We had no shachros mincha ma'arav. We had no, please put on tefillin. I'm not Chabad, so I'm not allowed to do that. Right? If you're not Chabad, you're not allowed to ask somebody to put on tefillin. That's like, whoa, it's like their territory, right? It's like I always say, we have things divided up very well. Chabad is not allowed to go into a hospital and give food to a sick person. That's Satmar's job, right? Satmar would never ask you if you put on tefillin. That's, you know, we have things, peace, peace in the land of Israel. We have things divided up. So how can you be makar of all these kids if there was no cure of, what did you do? I'm not Eishat Torah, I'm not Ur Sameach, I'm not Kabach, I'm not Nanach, I'm not Chabad. That, those are pretty much the ones who do Kirov. What was your secret? What I ended up doing totally by accident is what I'm going to be teaching you. Because parents started calling me, and I wasn't, it's a whole different story, I wasn't interested in helping parents. I didn't like parents 20 years ago. I was like, give me your kids and leave me alone. You guys just stay out of it. And then... I ended up working with parents. I ended up liking, you know, most of you. And I ended up realizing that I discovered the piece that they need. It's like a computer. It's just missing a piece inside of them. And when you do that piece, you don't need all the other stuff. They don't need Kirov. They don't need, I don't want to say they don't need therapy, because after they were re rehabilitated and they feel like VIP, they, then they needed therapy. But therapy is not going to make them to get to the place that you can do therapy on them, especially not stage four, where you can't do therapy on people that, are, that want to die. The psych wards aren't the solution. Sending them out to Utah is not a solution. I always say they don't need Utah. They need you, ta. And we did it successfully. And the, the, I closed Home Sweet Home because the same kids that were supposed to come into me, the parents ended up coming to me, and then the kids said, I don't need you. So I realized instead of helping three, four, five, six kids a year, we could help 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 kids a year by giving the parents the knowledge that I uncovered by accident. This was, this was a total experiment that Apiteva should have failed, should have bombed. But we were very, very successful. And um, that's really what what I'm really here to teach you. If the parents and the community can do what we did in Home Sweet Home, which I really wish people all over the world should be replicating it, because there is, I mean, whoever, everybody knows, the success we had is just off the charts. We had more success than any rehab in the world, any psych ward in the world, any cure of center in the world for these type of kids. When I closed it, I made an album of each year of memories, and these kids are around and thriving, Baruch Hashem. I'll go back to the one point. Why were these three, four kids, did they leave, again, not anti, but not the health of the other kids, and not Shem Mitzvah Mitzvahs? And I realized afterwards, these kids didn't have a family to go back to. These were the kids that, one of them, you know, Tzabrachan families, whatever it was. So that means that it wasn't like they were the same as the other kids and then the last day they, they re reversed the, their position because they didn't have a home. That means that the whole process that was internally happening with the other kids after a month, after two, after three, that they were just getting healed and feeling part of Kal Yisrael and it's like sub, subconsciously they, they knew they had a place to dock, you know? So they went in that direction and these guys, as much work as we did, and, and we saved their lives, and we save them from, from suicide and overdose. True. And they're not against Yiddishkeit, but because they didn't have where to dock, the whole process didn't, didn't bring them to Shmir HaMitzvah. It's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Every kid that had a, a from family waiting for them, even though I, I wasn't doing TP and they weren't accepting at that point, but they knew that if I will be from, I will, I will have a family to go back into. They, that's what worked for them. And then at, at, knowing that their parents, and then once they started getting better, their parents were saying, were, were coming and, and joining the process. I saw the power of parents and the power of not having a docking station. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to teach you how to do what I did by accident with my support system of of volunteers they knew the kids knew i wasn't getting paid 
the kids knew the volunteers weren't getting paid, and the Shabbos hosts weren't getting paid. They knew that there were about 50 to 100 people who were busy with them. And every time, since they were volunteers, and they saw them like once a week, everything was with a smile. Because there was no being overwhelmed of the same kid over and over again. There was no re rebellion against them. I had to deal with the rebellion against me because I was a steady person. So they would very often rebel against me. And the way that I dealt with it, which is what I'm teaching parents to do, like I said, made the tikkun inside of them that even though I'm a failure, I'm failing, I'm struggling, I'm not being discarded. I didn't take it personally, and I looked at them as, this is really hard for you. I was once there, 6 o'clock in the morning, waiting for a few hours for a boy who escaped in the middle of the night to come home. And he came home at 6 o'clock in the morning, finally. I was there from like 3 to 6. He opens the door, walks in, sees me. Right, I'm the big scary authority. He walks in, I said, have a seat. He was so scared, like a four, fourth grader, you know, and then the rebelliousness comes out and he's ready to take me down. I'm like, are you okay? Do you want a drink? He's like, I'm okay. I said, you want a coffee? Yeah. Are you okay? What happened? Where'd you go? Well, uh, I'm like, okay, so get some sleep. We'll talk about it later. And I, I totally didn't take it personally. Of course, it's much harder when it's your own kids. But I, I showed them at that point that I still believe in you, and we're going to get through this together. That kid who I'm thinking of, he's today, Shema Torah Mitzvah, married, from with kids, lechdig, learns, the whole thing. And at that point, I could have said, well, you broke the rules, so, you know, get out. But that doesn't work. And we shouldn't have to wait for stage four kids on the street. We should learn how to deal with kids who break rules earlier. It's a fantastic opportunity. Because when a kid breaks rules, they're vulnerable, and they're testing us, not on purpose, but it's a test to our commitment to them. If we learn how to deal with kids when they break the rules, we have the highest chance of success in healing them.